I'm Sumana Hariharishwara, and I am Volunteer Development Coordinator for the Wikimedia Foundation. Who here loves Wikimedia? Woo. Yay, all right, great. I just, I need motion to ensure that my talk is working and that you can hear me. I'm used to doing stand-up comedy, so I'm used to measuring my effectiveness in laughs per minute, but I don't think, <laughs> thank you, all right, good. Just a test there. Um, I know that uh, there, I, I think I set up too ambitious a proposal for this talk, especially because I only have 20 minutes, probably 18 now. Um, so I'm talking about some case studies of failure and success very quickly. Draw out from those some common failure and success tactics, workflow description and workflow improvement description and an explanation of how to get involved. So basically, the software that Wikipedia runs on, MediaWiki, is developed by a lot of people, some paid, some unpaid. And if you, as a Wikimedia contributor, want to get something made or done or changed, then there, in the past we found some ways that works and some ways that doesn't work. Let me set you up with some context. We have a tiny, tiny paid tech staff. Um, that, we are one of the top 10 websites in the world in terms of how, how many you know, visits we get. And we probably have like you know, one to 5% the size of the staff you know, developing software and maintaining those systems. Um, we are aiming in our hiring to hire people who empower volunteer contributors to get more stuff done. Or we hire people to, to do what the community wants as represented by like the priorities set by the board and the strategy process and stuff like that. You know, the community cares a lot about mobile, so we're hiring a product manager and another developer for mobile. We care a lot about internationalization, so we're contracting and hiring some contractors to work on that. We're, but uh, we care about accessibility, so we're, you know, we're working on possibly hiring on that. And um, I'm like, Eric, is it okay to say that? Um, <laughs> And, uh, like, but there's also stuff that needs to happen just to keep everything moving, like a tester. We are hiring our first tester, and we, that, you know, if we were a software organization appropriate to the size of the thing we're doing uh, in terms of paid, uh, paid people, then we would already have a bunch of testers. Um, our main aim is providing this service, you know, content, and not developing the software itself, right? The developing of the software is not the mission of the Wikimedia Foundation or the uh, Wikimedia movement. It's the encyclopedia. So we're supporting that. Um, and we have to serve approximately 450 zillion different interests, right? Um, so, you know, let's say some community really, really wants their own analytics so that a particular entity can track how often an image that they uploaded get, you know, gets viewed within a particular geographic area or something like that. You know, well, we're, we can't serve that particular interest necessarily by putting a person's time on it, but we are hiring like three or more analytics people to help get statistics on stuff and, and create the platform that everybody will be able to use and that you know, volunteers will be able to use to build additional functionality. Um, and another bit of context is that, is that sometimes accidents happen. <laughs> um, is that most of the paid staff is in San Francisco and they accidentally have face-to-face -face conversations. And uh, sometimes that's not very transparent and therefore uh, people don't make decisions in secret but they have conversations about eventual decisions and sometimes they happen without enough transparency. This is why, part of why I exist. Um, I volunteer development coordinator, Guillaume Pamier, uh, is it technical communications director or something like that. Um, and uh, Mark Hirschberger, the bugmeister, or person who you know, looks for things in the, uh, bugs, uh, in the bug database and requests that need to be called out. We together are the technical liaisons and developer relations group, which shortens to TLDR. All right, there's a, that's, that's a bit of slang for, a lot of people use TLDR for too long, didn't read. So uh, it was a bit of a joke there. Um, but anyway, we, we are the canaries in the coal mine. We try to get transparency for you. 
and we try to be bridges and liaisons to help you get what you want from the MediaWiki developers who ultimately end up what software enables your work on, on the wikis and Wikimedia. But we only want to be liaisons and bridges. We don't want to be bottlenecks. We want to help empower you. Um, so, how do we try to work with the community at every phase? So, the earlier, the, it, it's more diffuse the earlier the idea gets, right? Just a, a sheer idea of like brainstorming, you know, you're gonna find that anywhere. You're gonna find people talking about that at like you know, in the village pump and in various mailing lists and talk pages and stuff like that. But where do developers, in my experience, and I've only been at the Wikimedia Foundation and concentrating on this stuff for a few months now. I was hired full time in May, so I'm very new. But from what I can tell, where do developers actually look to find out what communities want? They are not looking at the individual village pumps of the 800 wikis, right? Yeah, Brian's nodding his head with like a smile. You know, I'm taking that as a yes. Um, they're looking at bugs in Bugzilla, which is our request and defect tracking tool to systematic, because you know, it's basically a systematic way to file and search these kinds of requests. Um, they're looking at the mailing lists dedicated to MediaWiki itself. There's, well, the main one there is wikitech-l, which is uh, a MediaWiki uh, uh, developer's mailing list hosted at wikimedia.org. Um, and we ask questions in these interfaces as well, um, and via requests for comment on the MediaWiki development wiki, which is mediawiki.org. Oh, and I will be putting up like uh, some notes from all of this uh, after, after my talk and uh, syndicating it to Planet Wikimedia and stuff like that, so you will be able to find all this. Um, and we ask questions via, for example, Guillaume, uh, posting to the blog, the main uh, Wikimedia Foundation blog, and um, he's also uh, been leading an effort to make sure that any given project or sort of open question, the thing we're trying to work on to improve the functionality of uh, MediaWiki related uh, projects, there's some kind of project page for that on MediaWiki.org. So there's a few different places where we actually look for community contributions. And there's our chat channel, our IRC channel, um, which is a real-time chat where you can talk to a lot of developers. So those, in my experience, are the places where developers are actually looking for hearing from the community. Um, that's, you know, that, that's where they're already doing a lot of development work, and community people who uh, come in are usually listened to. And the links are all in the etherpad because Guillaume is a demon. Um, next, sort of design, and by this I mean sort of interface and visual design. Um, Brandon Harris and Neil Kundalgunkar are uh, especially w dedicated to listening to the community on this stuff. Uh, there's the article feedback tool. You know, there is a discussion page about that that has lots and lots of responses from Brandon, for example, and um, they. Uh, uh, they they uh, they hang out in the relevant IRC channels and they uh, they give talks about this stuff. Um, I I think we might be doing better on this, but design is notoriously iffy and difficult to pin down as a way to get something to get community impact about. Um, prioritizing when we talk about how do we prioritize with the community? In my experience, so one of them is the community is represented by the board. And the board sets these priorities in, like the product white paper, um, strategy documents, and stuff like that. And then those bubble down to us as, all right, these are the things the paid people are going to work on. Part of my job as volunteer development coordinator is to help volunteers who are thinking about what to do next and align them with, hey, mobile is really important, or the new visual editor is really important, and here's how you can work on that. Um, also, you will notice us prioritizing and deciding what to put into next things, uh, into our next actions, and what to concentrate on. If you look on the Wikitech L mailing list, or uh, via Mark Hirschberger, who uh, he helps talk with the community and talk with the various developers to prioritize the fixing of individual bugs that people have put into Bugzilla. Sometimes. Um, in the past, that was a problem that people would report defects and then they wouldn't get addressed for a while and Mark is dedicated to fixing that. Um, development itself, 
our, you know, talk, we talk with the community in, in IRC, via Bugzilla, on MediaWiki.org. It's really the same as brainstorming, as what I said earlier. And the TLDR group as a whole, you know, is dedicated to communicating with the community about what we're working on and, and asking feedback back. Um, testing. We rely on the community for lots of testing. Um, volunteers. We're, we're high, we don't have anyone on staff whose main job is testing. Um, so well, we, we're hiring someone right now. So uh, I wrote a document. Uh, it's a part of my role was people were asking, oh, how do we test? And so I wrote a document about this is currently how we test. So that's the kind of thing where, again, the paid people exist to empower volunteers, really. Um, deployment, I know I mentioned this in my talk proposal, and then I looked at it, and I was like, you know, deployment is not really a place where I think we look for a lot of community feedback. Um, Ryan is looking at me with like a questioning eye. I don't know. What do you think, Ryan? Oh, you think we do? Like what, via like shell requests, or what are you thinking? We'll look for community feedback Look for community feedback after deployment? Uh, broke. What broke? Right, okay, that's true. Um, it's called testing. It's called testing. <laughs> um, Yeah, we, we do, though, try to uh, look out for specific things that we know are going to change when we do uh, a big release deployment. Uh, so for the 1.17 release earlier this year, you know, we knew there were a lot of JavaScript changes. And we did actually try to specifically reach out to uh, both extension developers and uh, people working on gadgets and custom side scripts. Uh, it wasn't necessarily uh, always 100% successful ahead of time, so certainly there were problems that were not discovered until after. Uh, but that's the way it goes, and uh, it's a learning experience, and we want to keep improving that. By the way, all of you can hear me. Can all of you? Uh, is there anyone here who can't understand me because I'm talking too fast or something like that? Please do raise your hand. Although I realize you might not be able to understand that request. That's not <laughs> useful. If you can understand her, raise your hand. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Good. This is this is why it's good to have programmers around who are good at logic. <laughs> all right, Boolean. May all your Boolean dreams come true, Brian. Um, wow, very little groaning at that pun. Um, and then uh, translate. Uh, oh, upgrades. Uh, shell requests. We, tr we. This is one place where like village pumps really do get viewed. Is when someone who is from a particular wiki, like let's say. Malayalam Wikipedia says, uh, we want this feature. And then our question will be, have you gotten consensus for this? And usually that's a, a village pump page or, or something like that, like a talk page on that wiki where we look to see, has there been consensus achieved on this before we uh, you know, flip the switch? Um, and uh, Mark Hirschberger is another person who you know, works on this and ensuring that things don't fall through the cracks. Translations. Is Zebron here? No. Zebron Mazeland is, to me, the king of all that internationalization stuff. Um, and but you know, he he works on Translate Wiki, which is you know the locus of translation activity, uh, and it seems very uh, community driven. So I'm happy about that. Um, but uh, oh, and then documentation. So a lot of the documentation about how MediaWiki works. <coughs> is on MediaWiki.org, our dedicated wiki. When you say Wikimedia and MediaWiki and Wiki a lot, it gets confusing, and I'm sorry about that. Um, I haven't run the numbers, but whenever I visit a MediaWiki.org documentation page, like our manuals on how to do a particular thing or something like that, when I look at the history, the edit history, most of those edits are not by staff people. Most of those edits are by volunteers, in, as far as I can tell. Um, and I, I appreciate that. Um, if we, th that is also a place on MediaWiki.org. Um, if you need better documentation on how something happens, I think it is a reasonable place to, to put uh, a question. Do you say I have five minutes? Oh, crap. Um, but Guillaume is also a, few, uh, a force here to be reckoned with on documentation. So now I have five minutes to talk about how we failed in the past and how we're trying to change that. So, okay, maybe I don't have enough time to say anything political or offensive. That's good. Um, okay, so 
Uh, there is a really, really, really old bug, a request. Uh, these are just a few examples, right? I'm sure we failed a hell of a lot. Um, there's a really old request in our Bugzilla to make it easier to read musical notation or sheet music. I'm hearing a groan. Yeah, this, it was bug 189. Oh, are there, there are people who remember the bug number. And if you look at it, the, uh, the bug has like more than 100 comments from people over the course of many years really frustrated that obviously several people want this, but we didn't implement it. Um, there was basically bad communication all around. Um, this was during a period when MediaWiki had very few developers. And we were, there were just not enough people to really pay attention to all the things that lots of, 450 zillion different requesters wanted. And um, thank you, Arya Gregor, volunteer for Fight of the Good Fight, and basically being the person in those comments who was like, I think this is what the developers want, and this is what the community members want. Um, we just simply, we didn't have what we have now, the Bugmeister and a lot of developers who could actually respond and say, well, this is what's necessary in order to fulfill this request. Um, it was also unclear at the time who was setting priorities on what gets done. We're working on fixing that. Um, we have more managers and more people thinking about these things um, on an ongoing basis. And if you have a question about what priority something is, there's a lot more people to ask, like the people in the TLDR group and uh, our boss, Rob Lanfear. Pending changes. Oh, no groans? Um, it sounds, I, I am extremely new, and so this is where you, you know, rise up and burn me, but it seems to me like um, the situation with pending changes was that lots of people couldn't get to consensus in the communities, for example, English Wikipedia, but the foundation didn't prepare a good way, like a method or litmus test, uh, or you know, the litmus test has, uh, wasn't good enough or something like that. Defining the problem right really helps. And this was a, a creeping project where lots of people had different ideas about what they wanted and structuring discussion well really helps. If you were at the panel that I just moderated, you know that I really believe in that. Um, and then there's more successes than failures. I hope there's more successes than failures these days. I'm gonna need like at least two more minutes, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, like uh, Upload Wizard and the licensing tutorial, you know, we put something out and then we pay a lot of attention to bug reports and feedback coming in via like the Commons L mailing list and the Commons IRC channel. And we found that, you know, we need to get open feedback through the whole process, not like go away for a while and then come back and say, ta-da. And we need everyone who's working on this stuff to pay attention, all the developers on a project to try and pay attention to what community folks are saying in the places where they're talking. Um, we can't just count on one person to be a bridge because then that person might be a bottleneck. And then there's stories where we're responding to a need that we see in the community that we hear about through, maybe through multiple channels. Um, Wikilove. Um, the resource loader, which uh, we're, you'll hear a talk about later today, this is in response to continuous feedback about what we need to make things faster and to support lots of features that people need. So it's sort of a platform thing. Um, the Bugmeister, we heard, oh, there's a problem communicating with people, uh, with the developers, and so we, you know, we hired someone whose job it is to look at the bug database and make sure things don't fall through the cracks. And then the installer, in the most recent version of MediaWiki, People at the foundation did a lot of work completely rewriting the installer of MediaWiki, which they don't need because they always just upgrade. They don't do a fresh install. But we heard from a lot of people in the MediaWiki development and administration and use community that the installing was really hard. So we worked on that. And uh, a lot of the time, you know, we, we have to dedicate most of our resources to doing things that directly benefit Wikimedia readers and editors, but this is a case where we did something a little different because it was important to the development community as a whole. We have a lot of stuff to, um, um, a lot of priorities to balance there. Um, I, I have to write, okay, so some places to, uh, I, you, a lot of you got a little piece of paper about ways you can help. Um, let me just mention the places to keep your fingers on the pulse of the development community once more and to get what you want by asking us questions or saying things that you want. The Wikitech L mailing list, the roadmap, uh, there are pages on MediaWiki.org if you search for the word roadmap. Those are places to see uh, what we're doing on MediaWiki as a whole or for individual components. Uh, the product white paper, which Eric Moeller led, uh, 
which tells you what we're focusing on in our development and why in response to what specific board priorities. Uh, the blog, the major Wikimedia Foundation blog at blog.wikimedia.org, uh, especially the monthly reports that Guillaume helps put together, or leads, I should say, excuse me, that tells you what the engineering department is working on. Um, the IRC channels, if you are not quite clear what IRC is, come up to me later and I will show you how magical it is. Um, and the places we look for your comments and questions to guide us, again, our bug reporting and enhancement request filing system, Bugzilla, comments on the blog, comments on IRC, questions on the Wikitech L mailing list. Um, these are often more efficient ways to get developers' attention than Foundation L or the Village Pump or other media. Now, you know, discussing with other contributors, you know, of course, you should do that wherever you want. But if what you want is to get the attention of the software developers, you know, these are the more effective places to go. Seven ways for interested community members to make bigger impacts on MediaWiki development. File bug reports. Don't just you know, email one person. Don't just post it on your blog. If you want something, go to bugzilla.wikimedia.org and file a bug report. Say what you want. Specifically, say what the situation is now and what you would like it to be. Um, documentation and planning. Um, if you are a volunteer and you have kind of a control freak frame of mind, talk to me because I'd like to use you um, to, to help us with uh, MediaWiki documentation, planning, and management. Talk to us at conferences find, you know, to tell us what you want. Now is a great opportunity, uh, well, uh, at, the, at the break. Blogs and IRC. Um, evangelize our messages to other people. Um, if you know what we're working on, then tell other people. Uh, and also, if you uh, see a problem, if you are a tech, somewhat technical person, try downloading and beta testing some of our early releases uh, of MediaWiki. And if you are partly, you know, if you're more technical than that, then um, so a little bit of entry level coding would be great. Um, bug triage is, is a form of, uh, of testing, and if you're interested in testing and, and saying that other people are wrong, then talk to me. Um, and uh, I have some, some additional thoughts here, but, but I've run out of time. I'm sorry. I didn't realize I'd have a 20 minute slot instead of 30. Um, I probably don't have any time for questions right now, do I? No, no, I don't. I'm sorry. I've run over. But I will be around today and during lunch, um, and so I should uh, thank you very much for your time and hope to talk to you about this uh, one on one. didn't have time of the Firefox team, the Mozilla team, they put up some posters about uh, Sparkle. Now, I have no idea what it means, but it's, <laughs> it's supposed to help in this kind of situation where you don't have time to talk in the conference, but want to talk later. So maybe ask them, maybe that would help. Now we have Brian, Neil, and Trevor to talk about the, visual, the upcoming visual editor. The, um, it actually, if, uh, if we, we could probably get that Earl put into the, um, you know, the okay, man, all right. Uh, so we, uh, one of my goals for the year last year was to actually create a style guide and, and, and make a shell, and so we did that, and it's out there, and it's clearly something that's under discussion. We can always change it, but it's, I, it's meant to be an evolving process. Uh, there's multiple phases to it. The first one was actually getting down the basics. And it's written, or I tried to write it in such a way that any developer or extension developer can actually look at it, read it, and understand some motivations and, and just learn some basic UI principles. Um, and not have to like, you know, read all these bazillion blogs and, and ever have to go to usability.com. Uh, then, in addition to that, uh, several of the developers, um, are, as a side project, are working on modifying HTML form so that it will automatically spit out things in the correct format. And then, if we ever decide to change something in the future, you know, it'll just work. So, you know, it's got all sorts of kinds of, of support ideas, like right to left should just magically work. Um, other things along those lines, and uh, I guess that's about. I need to say uh, till tell Hotman. Huh. Timo, go ahead and stand up. So, uh, I just heard a trigger word that I like to. Uh, 
So I just heard a trigger word that I want to elaborate a little bit on. Um, auto magic flipping uh, to right to left. Um, later today, uh, I want to do a little plug here. Uh, around later today, there's a talk about the resource loader, uh, which will, um, I will explain more about that in that talk, but um, resource loader enables, uh, among other things, automatic flipping of your style sheet in a right to left language without having to have override rules and manual maintenance of that. So definitely come to that if you're interested in that. All right, any other uh, follow-up questions, answers about that? Uh, hold on, Alalita, will you stand up and introduce yourself? Um, I'm Alalita from the uh, features team at the WMF. And Brenda, I had a question for you. Are you planning to add accessibility guidelines into the design guide, and when? Well, good question is said. Um, so yes, uh, as, as things become, uh, there's already some accessibility uh, information in there. It mostly has to do with like dealing with um, uh, visually, impaired, visually impaired people, uh, but not like blind users. So it, it, that blind is a very difficult nut to crack and, and hopefully we would be able to actually handle that for you. If with inside HTML form and say like, okay, well the labels are labeled correctly and they have the right titles and the screen readers will be able to do them and, and manage that stuff. The, the guide itself has some comments about like, okay, when you make your thing, you need to understand that the dyslexic individuals see text like this or uh, people with macular degeneration will see this and here's some suggestions about color choice because people with red, blue, color blindness are gonna see things differently than that. And as these topics come up and uh, more common, we'll, we'll just add them in because again, it's the style guide anyone can edit. Um, hello, uh, just a moment ago, you might have heard the word HTML4 mentioned, but I don't think anybody actually explained what it was. Um, so just to clarify, HTML form is a form generation framework that I wrote about two years ago um, for the preferences system. Um, generally speaking, if you're writing new code, um, I don't know how many of you are writing new code, probably quite a few. Uh, it, if you're writing new code that involves forms, you should use this because uh, event, it handles all of the security issues associated with forms. It handles all sorts of awesome things like that. And, it, uh, and when our style guide gets integrated into it, your forms will automatically follow our style guide, which will be pretty awesome and will save you a hell of a lot of work. All right, I'm, I'm told by helpful organizer Lior that we have about five-ish minutes left. Um, so I can take one more quick question, then I'd like to have us do some closing remarks. Anyone else with a, with a question? And of course, you know, these people continue to exist after this panel ends, and um, you, know, you can continue to ask questions of them and so on. <laughs> Except maybe Brandon. You might disappear like, you know, into the ether, but no. All right, no. Um, are there maybe one more question? Oh, hold on, go ahead. What, what, What's your name? I, mean, I work in the um, English Judaism area, but I'm the other one programmer by profession. I'm just, oh, I guess I can hold it. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm just a user in this case. And I was just wondering, you, you folks do a wonderful job, but I, I'm just wondering, is, it's very difficult like, to find things. I mean, for example, there's a tool, there's a tool, for example, that I can find out who changed something, very important. But um, given that I'm only doing this a little bit at night, you know, working during the day, I have no idea how to find it. I have no idea where it is, or how to use it, or anything. Is, is there maybe some method of like getting more menuing and something to actually find things, so to speak, so we can actually utilize more of the software? I know this is probably some tool somebody wrote, but to um, um, just utilize more of the software? To start. No, I don't apologize. Reasonable question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Michael? Yes. Um, and perhaps you want to repeat the question and answer it? Um, the question was how to how to actually find all the nice tools that have cropped up around Wikipedia and other Wikimedia projects, and if there is a really an easy way uh, for for users to find out how to how to get through these tools. And I'm afraid there is not really a really great way because some of the stuff is actually developed by by core developers, some are extensions, but a lot of things have been. Uh, written just in, in JavaScript on, on one wiki and uh, the core folks don't even know about it. Or um, there's a lot of uh, tools writ written on and for the tool server by volunteer developers that are not working on the software itself, but kind of like 
using it and extending it from the outside. Um, I think actually the for, for practical reasons, the easiest thing to do is on the wiki you are working with, find the tools page. There's um, on Wikipedia, it's, it's called Wikipedia column tools or utility. I think tools will work, yeah. Uh, and there you will find the stuff people on that wiki actually use. And uh, putting that kind of thing into, na into navigation actually sounds like, yeah, sounds like a pretty good idea. On the uh, this is, since this is a page created and maintained by the community of that wiki, and the manual is also created and maintained by the community of that wiki, this is not really a, a thing that could be done by the software. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it could be more encouraged. On <laughs> Mostly the wiki administrators, yes. Yeah, but how do you find them? If you're just a reader, you know, how do you, how do you find out? Yeah, 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 okay. It's, th this is actually a pretty tricky question, but I think, well, developers are probably not the right people to really answer it. Um, a quick thing about uh, the tool you were asking about, how do you find out who wrote what? Um, I did a very quick light lightning talk the other day about um, a new tool that basically does that, which I dubbed um, Wikipraise, and I hope this will be something that will be available by default very soon for all readers. Yes, right. Uh, I'll, try, I'll try to, to keep it short, we're uh, running out of time here. Um, you mentioned something about uh, sharing uh, gadgets that are uh, managed by every single wiki uh, separately. Uh, one of the things that's coming in Resource Loader, Loader 2.0 is global gadgets. So that um, whenever a wiki creates a gadget, the problem is usually it gets copy and pasted all over the place. Um, and this is also damaging localization and things get outdated, things break. Um, Resource Loader 2.0 aims to centralize gadgets, especially the ones that are very well evolved but are just not very well localized, very well updated, and then you will be able to use them on every single wiki without having to uh, copy and paste them all over the place. So that's something that's coming very soon. Uh, very quickly, gadgets are one of the ways to write tools for... for your wiki, we have a panel, um, which will be by Brian Lane, <laughs> Timo, which I don't know how to pronounce your last name, sorry, and Rogers Glazer. Okay, hello, thank you. Um, so first of all, I need to clarify a few things. Um, it's not like, like, as you have seen in the program, um, testing should be the second track now. Um, apparently, the first track has been canceled, so we um, start now with testing. May I actually that? Sorry. Sorry. Hi, uh, I'm Sumana, and I'm giving... Uh, so so there's, there's an entire track today of discussion of MediaWiki development, and some of these talks were sort of overlapping in a way that wasn't going to be useful, it was just going to end up being redundant. So the talk that was going to happen right now about Wikimedia technology staff communicating with the larger Wikimedia community has been combined with my talk just in a, like an hour or two, whatever, just after the coffee break, which is how to get what you want from the MediaWiki developers. So it was just sort of a combination and moving around of stuff. Just wanted to let you know. And in response to some questions about the name of my talk, how to get what you want from the MediaWiki developers, I would like to revise that title to how to ethically get what you <laughs> legitimately want from the MediaWiki developers. And uh, yeah, it will be slightly less time than it would have been, sorry. <laughs> okay, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, in, the, in the next 30 minutes, we want to talk about testing and media wiki. So, if anybody wants to leave now, <laughs> um, uh, there has been um, a considerable movement uh, in, in, in testing things um, over the last year, I guess. Um, and um, I think what we should do here is shed light on uh, testing as a whole uh, from like uh, high level, very high level, the big picture. That's what I said in the subtitle. Um, so I'm going to show you in short what I understand that we do in testing at the moment and I hope that uh, Ryan and Timo can um, correct me if I'm wrong and then 
we do Q and A. Um, so if you have any questions about testing, and uh, I think there are some issues we need to talk about, um, then uh, I hope we get a nice discussion. So first of all, um, testing. Uh, I mean, I think everybody in this room does know why testing is important. Um, it makes developers sleep better. Um, because um, you somehow know that at least the mistakes you made before um, are not the ones you make now. Um, so um, testing can be done on different levels. Uh, did anybody in this room actually write a test for MediaWiki yet? Okay. Does anybody want to who didn't write a test? Hey, cool. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> Okay, um, so testing it can be done on different levels, so there are different testing strategies. Um, first of all, um, what you do is you test units like small bits and pieces of your code. Um, you know that if you um, have a, a PHP function, for example, and you want to um, put into that function values A, B, and C, you want to get out D. Um, for example, a, a function that is uh, called sum and it sums up um, A and B. Um, if you put in one and two, then you want to get three as a result, I hope. Uh, otherwise, uh, the function is not working correctly. So that's unit testing. Um, and most of the, uh, of the tests in, in detail are done on the unit testing level. Because when your units don't work well, um, then the, the whole uh, program will not work well. Um, next level. Um, I got this from the Wikimedia article on testing, so um, it must be right. Um, next level is integration testing, which um, uh, ha goes up one level and looks how the different uh, parts of the, uh, of the software integrate with each other. So you're not testing one function, but you're testing a whole bunch of, fun of functions, and you see if they work together well. Um, an example would be uh, maybe the do edit. Um, so if you want to test one single edit in um, uh, uh, a media wiki, there is a function do edit which calls a lot of other functions. Um, so it, it, a lot of things depend on each other. And that might be an example for, um, say, for integration testing, I guess. Um, and then you have the very high level, that is system testing, where you see, where you have a look at, or you test uh, whether the application works as a whole. Um, so that would be, for example, you press the edit button, type in something, press save button, and then see if the um, stuff you typed is actually being saved. Um, okay. What do we have in uh, MediaWiki? Um, for unit tests, uh, we do PHP unit. Um, that has been uh, parser tests for a long time, um, and uh, as I understand this now, Increasingly, other parts of the software are being tested with unit tests. Um, I have to admit that I do not follow the unit tests, PHP unit tests, so much, so I don't really know what's the current state um, of these tests, but I see that um, there are a lot of unit test commits in the SVN, so I guess um, there's been done a lot of work on that. Um, so, since um, yeah, vector skin and media Q 1.17, resource loader and all that stuff. There has been increasingly the demand for um, JavaScript unit testing, which is the client side um, of, of media Wiki software. Um, and uh, QUnit has been used on that part. And um, yeah, maybe, can you say something about that? So uh, uh, as a JavaScript developer, the interesting thing about JavaScript testing is that um, functions are not the way they used to be in PHP. In PHP, um, except for a few very rare edge cases, there's only one way to execute the function and it will always return the same if you give it the same. But in JavaScript, it behaves different on different browsers. So for example, in Explorer 6 might return a different value for something than something on Firefox 5. So that's why QUnit testing is a lot more complicated than PHP unit testing because you have to keep track of not only if it works in a, in a perfect browser, but if it actually works in the non-perfect browsers. Um, and for that, we use uh, several frameworks to automate these tests because we don't want to run them manually every single time. Of course, it's recommended that if you change a vital part of the program that you test before you actually make the commit to subversion. But um, we cannot expect that developers have 
a complicated setup such as uh, the Wikimedia Foundation may, may we have, or um, that you have every single browser that we support on your own home computer. And for that, we use frameworks such as TestSwarm and Cruise Control. Maybe we can talk about that later. So um, QUnit, as it says, is uh, mainly testing, is it unit testing. Um, it can also be um, integration testing. That's what we talked about, and I, I guess that's part of the discussion, part of this um, track. Um, so, and, and then, um, until recently, um, there was, uh, uh, was a track on, on Selenium, which is a um, kind of surface testing, you, you somehow you remote control the browser, so you don't really uh, execute JavaScript um, functions, but you, um, you tell the browser to click somewhere, to type in something, to click somewhere else, and that is part of the, um, the system testing part, so um, you do really high level tests, and um, there has been, um, in, in, in the last year there was a, a test suite, a small test suite um, that was programmed, uh, which tests um, the, like just the basic functionality of MediaWiki. Um, it makes about I don't know 300 clicks um, and, and tries to test all the main functions. Um, and this is used for smoke tests, which basically see if something burns um, and, and smoke races. Um, okay. So as Timo said, um, there apart from those um, testing frameworks, there are um, like test execution frameworks. Um, one is test swarm, um, where you can crowdsource tests. Um, so um, tests are executed not on your own computer, but you ask a lot of people to execute those tests in their browsers. Um, and, for, and that's because then you get a lot of different combinations between browsers and operating systems, and you can test like Mozilla on Linux, on Ubuntu Linux, um, or uh, Internet Explorer 5. something on a Windows 32, um, I don't know, uh, some even strange uh, combinations. Okay, and then we have cruise control or um, PHP under control, um, which is an extension for cruise control, and that um, executes tests on, um, on triggered events. So um, normally um, you execute those tests like once every day, um, and you can execute a whole bunch of test suites it's not bound to unit tests, it's not bound to Selenium, but you can, or, or test swarm, um, you can trigger those tests above, that uh, you see in, in the above section, um, on some basis. And uh, there was considerable effort uh, in um, the foundation to uh, have a framework that triggers execution of tests on any SVN commit. Um, but I don't know if that's still the case, because, um, yeah, it is. I, I usually um, um, explain the frameworks a little bit differently. Um, so uh, test swarm and uh, uh, control both are frameworks to automate the unit tests. Um, so for the PHP framework, we use PHP unit, and for the JavaScript framework, we use QUnit. And uh, whenever somebody makes a commit to subversion related to JavaScript, then test swarm picks that up and automates the test to all the clients that are currently connected to the swarm. And if you then look back at the test run page in a few minutes after you commit, you can see that it uh, works in Safari, it works in Chrome, it works not in Windows, it works, um, it works in Firefox, it works not in Opera, and all the different combinations that you can imagine. And at the same time, when a commit is made, it also uh, triggers cruise control to run the PHP unit tests. So basically, whenever a commit is made, both these frameworks uh, uh, run the test of their control on their uh, own framework. So we do actually have a need for something like Selenium, and we've recently dropped support for that from at least the foundation perspective side. Sure. Um, but we do still need something like Selenium to do these system level tests in an automated fashion. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's very difficult to maintain. So um, maybe this is something that we can uh, have more volunteer interaction with so that it can be maintained in a much better way than just me trying to automate all of the different operating systems and things like this and have David's. So, um, and system level testing as a whole, I think is something that we need a lot more of, especially in uh, a way that's more like the foundation sites, 
And uh, I'll be giving a talk later in the same room about this. It's um, an environment that we're building to allow these kinds of things and to allow more automated, or uh, manual testing and hopefully more automated tests of environments that are very similar to ours. It's uh, an environment that's going to be called labs. So the question I had um, when I was talking about tests is basically who, or when I was preparing this test, who needs to run tests? Um, and I guess there are three levels, um, although I'm not sure if this is an exhaustive list. Um, I guess that live code, um, I mean the code that's really been deployed, uh, needs to be tested thoroughly, but I guess it is already tested when it goes live. Um, but still, um, um, I think that you know when you commit small changes, then uh, still the software should be tested. Um, then you have the um, say the core developers, um, which test the the software um, in itself, and they, I guess, um, are doing a lot of uh, depending a lot of these automated tests. Um, that's what, what I think. I, I don't know if, it, if it's really the case. And then you have extension developers, which usually do not do a lot of testing, uh, apart from, uh, say, a few um, good, well-maintained um, well extensions. And uh, the question is, can we um, get those people also to test their code? Um, and um, how can we do that? So, um, for example, the what I, I was wondering is, um, can extension developers um, use the uh, given testing infrastructure um, that we have in MediaWiki that core developers use, or is it uh, a different kind of um, uh, environment? Um, should they set up their, their own environment? Um, right? Uh, I think people should have their own environments to do some development in, but I, I, I definitely think that we should have an environment for everyone to work in in a common way, where we're all doing things in in an environment that is set up in such a way that we can easily push to the site. I, mean, I know not everyone uses a Wikimedia style of architecture, but with the core projects are really important, what a lot of us are writing for is stuff for the foundation and for our sites. So, <coughs> yes, uh, I think that we should have a common environment, and that is uh, what the lab's environment is meant to be. So uh, uh, the PHP unit framework in MediaWiki uh, allows um, to extend the unit test for your own extensions. You can write uh, a test suite within the extension uh, directory to uh, run certain tests. And whenever this extension is installed in a wiki, for example, in your <coughs> local host wiki, and you run the PHP unit test from the command line, then these tests will also be run. So um, in itself, it's fairly easy to uh, maintain this yourself. But um, uh, on, uh, on uh, the MediaWiki uh, test form server and on the Moose Control server, um, there are several extensions installed as well. So the, uh, the, the most uh, popular extensions are the extensions that are installed on Wikipedia. Uh, will, um, for the most part, also be auto automatically run on every commit. OK, are there any questions so far? Yes. Uh, The test, uh, the the unit testing server that the foundation maintains um, cannot publicly be added an extension to it, um, because there are over I think there are more than two thousand extensions currently in subversion, uh, so we cannot test them all automatically. There's simply no resources for it. But um, especially for PHP unit testing, it's a uh, very lightweight to run them yourself. It's you only have to have a, a local host wiki, install the extension, and run them from the command line. Um, the reason Wikipedia has uh, several extensions installed on a test form server is that so that whenever, before we de deploy the code, we are sure that not just the core works, but extensions as well. But um, on request, I think it wouldn't be that big a problem to, uh, to install separate extensions on, on request. So sure, uh, if you're interested in that, contact us and uh, we'll see what we can do. I would actually like to be able to scale for us to be able to run all extensions, or definitely all the extensions that everyone wants the test anyway, because not everyone actually is going to write tests with their extensions, but I think if, if there is a need for this, I think we should try to scale for it. That's 
good news, right? Um, anybody else? Uh, question? Well, since you asked, uh, I mean, it's all fun games when you, uh, when you talk about how to run the tests and uh, um, who runs the tests and support, but uh, what about the tests themselves? Who writes them and do you have any criteria on the coverage or any, any other quality or anything? Um, okay. Um, I guess at the moment it's like the developers as opposed to write their tests. Um, which is one way of doing this. Um, and um, I guess there are criteria. Um, <coughs> you can find some of them on um, uh, mediawiki.org. Um, testing, I think um, there is some criteria within the page for Selenium framework. Um, and um, I... Well, testing has not been invented yesterday. And there, is yeah. there are like coverage criteria right. for uh, determining the, the quality and the... the how large is your test Yeah, um, so uh, PHP unit, I'm not sure if it's a plugin or if it's in PHP unit itself, but has um, a method to see how much percentage of the methods that your classes contain are currently uh, covered. Uh, we use this for MediaWiki itself in, in the core. Um, every few days or weeks we, we run this to see uh, if there are any classes or methods that have been added recently that don't have unit tests. So that is certainly very helpful to give insight. Um, do I have anything tested? Are there tests that are not used anymore? Is there classes that have like one new method that changed and doesn't have a unit test anymore? So that's very useful for that. Um, in terms of criteria, um, I think every developer uh, has their own workflow, but uh, the workflow that I personally would recommend is uh, maybe a little bit extreme, but uh, when writing a new framework, I usually write the unit test before I write the actual framework so that you can always see uh, what it is supposed to return and then that's what I uh, would like to see more. And um, as you say, Nate, that is, it shouldn't be that extreme. But um, when being realistic, I think when I compare it to most extension developers, that's currently not the case yet. But that's certainly where I want to go, and I totally agree on that. So basically, now every developer writes his own uh, unit test, and no one, no one checks it that really uh, executes all the traces. Either a plugin or a feature of PHP unit is to see what the current coverage is, so you don't have to manually check that. Does so that answer your question? But, but there's no requirement no. that they put code coverage of the What is the current? Yeah, what is the current? I think for MediaWiki 4, the coverage is 60%. Yeah, 60. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm more of a JavaScript developer. I'm not that familiar with the PHP unit framework. So the the, the unit test flow has a completeness test plugin that I wrote, and I think for the MediaWiki for JavaScript, the coverage is almost 90%. I've been working really hard on that. 90% of all methods, including the constructors, yeah. So when counting the actual methods, not the number of classes, uh, the coverage is really high. For PHP, I wouldn't know. I'd have to ask, uh, or try to run a command and see what the current coverage is. Excellent. Anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, I'm wondering if there's going to be some sort of crash course on writing tests at some point, um, because I think for a lot of I'd like to correct on that. We actually uh, don't have to have the infrastructure yet as the way we, we wanted to. Okay. Uh, right now, there's an experiment on a tool server that runs the test swarm uh, infrastructure, and there's a virtual machine in which we're in cruise control. Those are actually both uh, experimental. We are currently, um, there's a foundation project for uh, continuous integration testing, and Chad, Ryan, and I are basically mostly working on that to migrate all of these to a real physical server in, 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 in the cluster. That, would, uh, that has enough resources to, like the other person asked, to also run more extensions that we have enough resources. But this framework is currently not set up. My, my point, though, is not necessarily about the mechanics of actually getting the tests run regularly. My point is more about the mechanics. Uh, it's more about the architecture of actually having tests and having a standard way to write tests. And as far as I can tell, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, that framework is more or less in place. Um, so it, Given that, are we going to have some sort of uh, like a, are we going to have some sort of crash course, some sort of um, like page or video or some sort of presentation, something, so that all of us who've been around for a while but not been paying so much attention to testing can actually. 
what they're supposed to do to add tests to their code? I really thank you for that question. Um, so uh, for Selenium, um, there is a page and, and there are some like how to use how to write this. But I think what we should aim for in, at MediaWiki.org is have an integrated a page that is an entry point for all those people who want to write tests and where the style guides are on, where uh, like the details are on how you write tests. And I guess, um, I mean, if, if anybody wants to, I'd be, I'd be willing to start that page. And um, I invite all of you to, to just join in and, and write this together, right? I'm gonna answer your question with a question. And this is actually a question to the development team. Um, so we're already doing kind of courses in uh, code review, right? Yeah. So can we also do courses for testing as well and invite exactly the community in with us? Because that would be, I think that would be very useful. So we got five minutes left. Does um, anyone? Oh, I'm sorry. No. I saw on Twitter that at least one person in the back was like, "Hey, the developers are sitting down, and I can't actually see their faces. So, you know, they don't know like who to ask if they have more questions after. Can you ask the last two minutes to stand?" I'm not doing it in the back. It was a third row. Coverage is demanded, but it is not checked in that we have like a formal process for a specific number that we're going for. But we are highly encouraging tests, so uh, it, and we are you know, constantly it's going, it's hey, it's, it's add some more tests, add some more tests. Yeah. It's encouraged. You, you, yeah. you ask people to put it as yeah. high as possible, but you don't say, okay, if it's not 95, you cannot commit. Right. But we, you know, we will occasionally kick things back for not having tests. Yeah, sure. So, um, Previously, it was not a recommendation or even a requirement to have tests, but um, I think as of June, <coughs> April from this year, I can pretty much say that um, it is being frowned upon if something new doesn't have tests. And as soon as we can actually say ourselves that our coverage for the core thing is good, we should have that figured before we say to others that it must have a test because that wouldn't be fair, as you can imagine. But um, yes, right now there's uh, several new jQuery plugs that have been submitted uh, the last few weeks, and. Uh, some of them have been removed, some of them have been re-added, they must have uh, unit testing. That is uh, slowly becoming their requirement, yes. Um, well, since, since there is a lot of uh, uh, discussion about that, uh, anyway, um, are you interested in and will the infrastructure support that uh, if, uh, if someone develops uh, 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 a big test suite and provides it? Uh, in, in what form do you mean? Um, in, that's, that should be your, uh, your reply. What form do you need it and in what form? Uh, are you interested at all? Can it be integrated in a, a, a framework? Because I, as I understand now, the test case is per uh, extension and then for four, probably for, uh, for more. So the, 
there, 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 the framework of PHP unit, yeah. um, whenever a PHP unit test is being made, it extends the class for PHP, ba P PHP unit ba base test. And for the command line, that's for executing. There is an existing framework, there's a, a standard structure on how to, there's only, basically there's only one way to write a unit test. And um, yes, uh, via Bugzilla or from SVN, uh, patches, whatever, uh, configure which all are accepted. Yes? I guess for, for Selenium, I wrote a, a test suite that uh, allows you to, uh, uh, to build actions on a higher level. So you can, like you have an action, uh, a test for editing, uh, and then you can customize this test with um, all the object-oriented uh, ways you need to. Um, so uh, I guess that's what you're aiming at, is that um, to, to have like prototypes of test, test cases and then uh, just uh, move them around. Um, so there has been done some work um, and um, I think it would be cool if, if we could um, go further on that. Um, yeah, that's what I see. Uh, which should make it easier for developers to test at least the standard cases and set up some test environment. So I mean, I would love to have an environment like this. It's just it's very difficult to maintain. So hopefully, with within the labs project, we can have something where it, anyone that is interested in building this environment will be able to build it themselves as well. What I see, um, uh, basically, one of the um, challenges about writing tests in MediaWiki is that MediaWiki is highly configurable. Um, so you don't want to test just one set of configurations. Um, and there's been done some work on, on reconfiguring things um, dynamically for tests. And I guess that's my last slide. Um, that's um, one of the things I want to um, yeah, point you at. I guess there are some common grounds for all the tests we, we have. Um, QUnit, PHP unit, uh, Selenium test, which is you need some, how you need clean resources, database files, you need to switch configuration, um, and you need to track a testing session sometimes, especially when you do integration testing. And I was wondering, uh, could we not uh, find a way to to somehow abstract these common grounds and have a common before test something suite, um, which is it can do all these things for all the tests, and then you can after like um, having um, this whatever testing framework um, uh, control the resources configuration um, than uh, have execute, having it to, to execute the, uh, the test then. Um, Rowan? Um, so, so PHP unit has this. Um, QUnit doesn't actually need it because it doesn't even need PHP to work. Um, I guess Selenium needs this too? Yeah, it. yeah so you, I guess you could integrate it between PHP and Selenium, but QUnit JavaScript is kind of irrelevant in this context. Um, well, there is some configuration, yeah. but um, it doesn't, I guess Timo can explain this better because he actually wrote this stuff. Yeah, so um, again, the documentation is uh, really pending. That's one of the things that makes this really hard. And that's what, uh, at least one of the high priorities to actually uh, be able to, for, to enable for other people to help with this the documentation needs to improve. Um, the, in terms of uh, teardown and uh, startup for a unit test, that's, that's what you're referring to, um, that exists for PHP unit, it, um, it uh, creates a new database and it uh, tears it down afterwards. Uh, for for, for QUnit testing inside the browser, this is not needed. Uh, for the test form, this will be needed and it's currently also supported. Whenever a, new, uh, checks, um, sorry, whenever a new revision is being checked out, it gets a clean database and a clean uh, media between itself. Any more questions? Okay, so I think um, we have used up the 30 minutes around which. Um, thank you, Timo. Thank you, Ryan, for um, being on the panel. Um, yeah, I guess that's up to next track. Perfect. And so um, I presented a tool called Sticky last year uh, here at Wikimania that tries to address some of these shortcomings. And so the main, the main feature here is you have this one area I've circled here. And the, the, the thing is, I show you an edit, and you can decide three things. You either tell me it's vandalism, you tell me it's innocent, or you tell me you don't know. 
And then when you click one of those buttons, it will show you a new edit, and so on and so forth. So um, the idea here is that I use my metadata scoring algorithm to basically pipe, pipe scores into a queue, just like the other queue, but the difference is I store this queue on one of my servers. And it's a priority queue, such that edits with a high probability of vandalism go straight to the top of the queue. And then the only way out of the queue is that for someone else to edit the page or for you to click a button in my GUI when you tell me what it is. And so um, we, this, is, this is actually implemented. And um, so we have several active queues. The three systems I described that are active on Wikipedia that are capable of scoring edits, mine, the Wikitrust folks, there's these, these all have queues where they, where they insert these scores. And including um, Clubot, the next generation, because um, there's cases where it just barely doesn't have enough confidence. It can still send me its scores, such that we can use those as the basis to enqueue edits. And so the key, the key things here are, because I have a formal innocent button, I can make sure that no one in my GUI ever sees the same edit twice. If someone clicks innocent, and th then, then it's popped out of the queue, it's done, it's, no one else has to inspect it. And there's an, uh, a, re a reservation system. People check out blocks of edits from the queue, so no one is doing simultaneous work. So this is, uh, this is all open source, and if we have a chance at the end of this, we'll pop up the GUI and, and we'll walk through a couple edits. Um, so let's talk about academic progress. Um, this is, I think, we're really where the next generation of on Wikipedia systems um, is sitting. So prior to 2010, everyone who was doing this research um, evaluated their, their, their systems independently. And so these people, I was doing metadata research, there were people doing language research. We really had no idea whose system was doing better because there was no standardized way to evaluate it. So um, last year, um, Martin Pothast, who's a researcher out of Germany, he decided to create a corpus, basically a gold standard. Um, and he created this, this list of 32,000 um, English Wikipedia revisions. And he outsourced people at the cost of 15 cents an edit from um, the Amazon Mechanical Turk to get them to label him for him. So this cost about $4,000 or so, I believe, to create because he just didn't take one vote. I mean, he was, he was getting like three, three to five votes per edit to try to get some consistency, some, some consistency among the votes. But this corpus it was a big deal, and it's now a standard in the field. And so what it really set up was a competition he hosted last year where all these approaches could get together and, and see, see who had the best one. Um, a language approach one, that's one, W-O-N. Um, but, but more significantly than that competition was that it brought a bunch of Wikipedia researchers together, myself included. And last year at uh, Wikimania, we all got together and said, we have these three independent tracks of algorithms. We have the metadata folks, we have the language folks, and we have the content persistence folks. And we're all doing these different things. And what would happen if we were to put all of our approaches kind of together into a meta classifier? And so the goals there being to, to perform better in the long run, but also understand whose, whose features were, were most important. And so to give an idea of the scale at which these things operate, so I think now we have an algorithm with uh, 70 plus data points. That's the combination of all these features. And if you zoom in there, you, you can read all about them. But the point here being the problem space, I, we're getting confident now, is, is quite well covered. There's not too many things to parse out that exist anymore that we have not parsed out already. But so let's talk about the performance here. So um, this is what you call a precision recall graph. I don't know, let me see if I marked it, yeah. So the way, th these are a common representation machine learning. So basically the way you read it is um, along the bottom. Um, so that point right there is at approximately 0.3. So that says you can find about 30% of vandalism with about 99% accuracy. So that means you could probably find about 33% in this case at, at, at a 1% false positive rate. And so uh, when we combined all these things together, it, it worked really well, and it worked way better than any of these single approaches did. So, th so there's, there was not unique overlap. And so it's now the current baseline for performance, and it suggests that um, once we get this actually online and running in an implementable fashion, um, it should be able to uh, ex exceed known performance, the best known performance levels, which right now is the Clubot NG folks, since they, are, they have a bot, they have a bit of an advantage over the rest of us since they don't require humans to look at edits. And so um, looking at individual feature sets here, we see that um, kind of the green, the green line there, the language features are interesting. And so we see that for, for a small percentage of edits on the left there, it's extremely helpful, and these are, these are features with high accuracy. 
but um, towards the middle there, there's a sharp decline. And so this kind of speaks to the fact that these vocabulary words, when you know bad vocabulary words, they're very helpful. But there's a certain point there where once you get beyond a comfortable vocabulary, it's, it's, it's worthless. And obviously, we're, we're really beating ran random guessing very extremely well. And so there was a new, um, new edition of the competition this year, and it had two real changes. Um, the first of which was that the uh, corpus was in three natural languages. So, so, so pretty much all prior research had been done on English Wikipedia. And the second was that you're allowed to use future evidence. And so um, these things aren't published until September, but um, I did very well on it, so we'll talk about my approach, at least. So my strategy was we want more metadata. Um, language specifics are hard to implement. I don't speak Spanish and I don't speak German. So um, basically throw, throw those out. And in the process, you could create a model which is portable for all language editions. And so if we look at the evaluation results along these lines, um, they're, kind of, they're kind of interesting in that um, English or my evaluation over English Wikipedia was by far the worst of these languages. So, so um, if you, the way you judge these is, is typically by the area underneath the red curve. The more area that's underneath the red curve, the better you're doing. If you could imagine a red line that looked like this at a right angle, that would be perfect performance, which says your algorithm never makes an error, and the area under the curve would be one in that case. So what we see here is that the area under the English curve is, is slightly less than the other cases. And so um, this is something interesting that's, that's still to be resolved. And it might be a result of something like the edit filter being enabled on English Wikipedia, which means that these edits are getting blocked. And so some of the low-hanging fruit in the trivial vandalism never even makes its way into the English corpus. But um, th this, this bias still needs to be studied. And, and we'll skip that at the entrance of time. And so there's also been some other, some other research that should be noted this, this year, not just in my track, but in people who think about these things. And so um, one of them, um, labeled as, as reference 14 here, is this, this massive graph at the bottom. And the idea is we shouldn't be just looking for vandalism with a single model, but we need to develop tags for the different types of vandalism. Um, and so massive deletes have a very different signature than bad word insertions have a very different signature than, you know, bad formatting or repeated characters. And so as a first pass, we should try to detect which type of vandalism it is before we try to apply a very specific model for that. And there's also an interesting paper here about tools like Huggle in the, in the formal warning process. So let's basically talk about the future here and how these, and how these scores, as they continue to be more accurate, can be, can be integrated better into the community. And so the first is, is pending changes, which is obviously hi highly controversial, at least on English. And so basically the idea is, we talked about that priority queue for the, as part of the sticky tool. And what if we were to take the very top worst edits as part of that and, and kind of dynamically move those under pending changes protection? So as the graph at right shows, we, we score the output, we score the edit, right? If it's really bad, we revert it. If it's really good, we just let it live. But if it's in this middle ground where it's kind of suspicious, and maybe say an IP editor made it, we should, we should just flag that immediately and say, no, we're not gonna let this edit go live on Wikipedia until someone with the reviewer rights gets to actually inspect it. And so there's also been a proposal to um, smart watch lists um, at a site here. This was something um, I think took place on Jimmy Whale's talk page. Basically this idea of coloring, coloring watch lists for vandalism and, and not just showing the most recent change, but showing a whole history of changes since someone last accessed the page. And so kind of my final point here is um, the, the tools on Wikipedia do need to work better together. And so kind of what I propose here is something I call the anti-vandalism clearinghouse. Um, so while I like to prop my tool up sticky and the no notion that we have this innocent edits, the fact is most people still use Huggle and I don't think I'm gonna convince them otherwise. But what if they, everybody could talk in, a, in an IRC channel and say, I know this person looked at this link and they didn't revert it. And that's kind of an implicit innocent. And if like all the bots could put their scores in and all the tools could speak back and forth about who's looking at what edits, there could be a whole lot less um, rep rep repetitious work. And finally, from, from, from kind of the foundation side, it would be interesting to, if we could have um, some support from, from them in terms of um, just space to run these algorithms. Because, um, so Cluebot gives its scores to me, right? And um, so one day I, uh, I noticed they weren't giving me scores anymore and I went to their IRC 
And I'm like, oh, what's, what's going on, guys? It's like, you're not giving me scores. And it's like, we know, the bot's down, because um, its owner had to take the computer to a LAN party. And this, this absolutely blew my mind that something that's performing dozens of edits a second on Wikipedia could be stopped because somebody had to go to a LAN party. So, <laughs> and so, um, as, as I mentioned, um, the space is pretty well covered. So moving forward, um, most, m much of the research is looking at kind of the really dangerous subsets of vandalism. Um, I've had my fun reverting the work of 12-year-olds at, at their high school. I'm trying to look for more dangerous things. So obviously the next talk we'll talk about um, external wing spam, who should be financially motivated. And there's also going to be a paper published at Wikisim, the academic conference, about deleted revision. So um, revision deletion, not deleted pages. And the notion that um, um, certain administrators have the ability to delete edits that um, specifically for legal reasons, if they show uh, liability, <coughs> defamation, revelation of privacy information. These are things which endanger um, the foundation legally, it would seem. So it's, so it's interesting to understand these edits. And with that, I'll open that up for questions. Yeah. Have you heard of tool server? I have heard of tool server. So can you not run a box on the server? Well, I'd, you should, maybe I'll get the clue out in, I mean, I have plenty of resources myself, but I know that these, these particular people do, do not, so. <coughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm aware of the tool server, so. Okay. So repeat that, they, they are moving to the uh, tool server. Is my understanding that a more conscious protection is not always at a fault? However, it seems that the one you described does not make a differentiation. It's a false positive element. Um, well, there, 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 um, there is. So um, the precision calculation take takes that into account, I believe. So. So, so, so these, so it's not these. You're not. We're not talking about accuracy. We're plotting precision here, which is slightly different. Um, there's, there's. You can look it up. There's a formula. So if not, we'll take this offline. I can't. True, it's true positive. It's over true. You know, okay. there are three of those quantities in, 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 a, in a fraction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that's of course a concern. Um, so um, IPs aren't allowed to use it. We're considering only if people with the rollback right should be allowed to use it. But uh, I mean, this is, this is, ultimately we're building a collaborative queue on top of a collaborative wiki. Um, it, m many of the same problems carry right over in terms of civil attacks and things of that nature. Um, at some point you could always require a voting algorithm where two people have to say, Innocent in order for it to be kicked out of the queue, things like that. But and because you're curating, you distribute the, the second one, it would be very unlikely. Yes. Like yeah, yeah. So that we haven't had those problems yet, so why waste the additional one review per edit at this point? Yes. Okay. No. So, so uh, I have some very, I have some very crude monitoring tools. I'll, I'll say um, I get, I have certain triggers where if somebody's moving what looks to be a little too quickly, or I know um, kind of the accuracy at which these algorithms should operate. Um, if it starts to fall outside those, I can go in and look and see who's see who's doing what work. Yes. Yes.
Um, so, like I said, so when we're talking about the good and bad collection, that's a lot of what the pot has individual did in outsourcing these and giving giving them to Amazon Mechanical Turks. So that's so um, yeah, and I'll admit there's there's probably some slight degree of, of bias in that data set because if these people really know what vandalism is or isn't is questionable probably, but um, it, it's the best there is out there today. And so this is this is um, a, a screenshot of a spady tool. Who's feeding you the edit? So right now, this, these are edits being fed by Cluebot, but you can also select any of the other algorithms. So because they right now have orthogonal approaches, uh, sometimes once one cue gets kind of dry and there's not much vandalism, and you shift to the next one, and, and you'll find find some 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 vandalism there. Yes. So so yes, I'm I logged in before the stop the talk started here in the top left. Uh, you just uncheck the uh, report in the editor box right there. Yes. Yes. So basically, everything that I every every click that happens in here is fed back into the machine learning alg algorithm because then I have definitive labels from from humans to improve the scoring process. <laughs> about an interesting subset of this, the most interesting subset. Because having looked at thousands and thousands of these edits myself, um, it becomes a little discouraging um, knowing, knowing who you're reverting. And that I'm, I'm a security researcher by, by training, and so reverting the edits of 15-year-olds of um, isn't the world's most fulfilling thing for me. So I started to think, like, what, what's a more, how do you find a smart attacker in this space? And so the big idea is I wanted to design a framework to catch these people including those employing one subtlety. So, so certain attackers who want to get their link to stick on Wikipedia will be very subtle, and they'll kind of just stick into the flow of things, put it at the bottom where it belongs, give it a good description, don't, don't look too bad. Well, but there's a second class, which is um, some of the vulner vulnerabilities in recent literature. In particular, um, I wrote a paper describing how um, what one could do, do bad things with link spam to Wikipedia. And so as part of kind of an ethical responsibility almost, um, I, I have this paper which um, fixes it. <laughs> and so then, much like we talked about, this, this feeds right into the other stuff. So we hope to do the really bad stuff by bot, and the rest will hand to something like Sticky that can prioritize the inspection of the rest. So let's begin by talking about the motivations. Everybody should know what, what kind of link spam is by nature. It's and seen obscenely subjective based on the based on the policy, and um, there's two real things that can go wrong with a link. And so the first is the intuitive; it's the destination, right? So if you link to um, some shock site, that's obviously a bad destination. Um, commercial sites, similarly. There's also more subtle things like what Wikipedia would call non-notable sources and stuff like that that will probably would not be con you would never see in an email spam type situation. And the second, you can have issues with presentation. And so um, if you put a link on line zero, um, even if it's to the New York Times, that that's probably should be considered a spam link per, per the policy that has, has been established. And so why, why is link spam an interesting area of research? So it's not entirely different from um, things like forum spam and blog spam. Um, and there's a lot of literature on how to detect um, spam, in the, spam in these types of scenarios. But wikis, and, and Wikipedia in particular, is, is unique for a number of reasons. And the first is that when you think about blog comments, they're typically append only in nature. So if a spammer wants to add something, where is it going? It's going straight to the bottom of an article where it receives less attention. And there's also generally you can't do markup in these type of environments. 
Whereas it's kind of an inherent part of Wikipedia editing that you could put something in line zero size 100 font, a la. You could, you could do that quite, quite easily. And second, there's massive traffic. Obviously, Wikipedia is sixth, seventh most popular website on the internet. Um, that's a humongous amount of viewership um, to the, the, that could see your spam links if you were to get them up there. Um, third, there's a large topic space. So a lot of spam, like email spam filters and, and, and spam in blog comments, depends on looking at the topic of the post and then looking at the topic of the comment. And if these two don't agree, if someone, if you're trying to talk about, um, I don't know, soccer balls, and they're down there trying to sell Viagra, there's a topic disagreement here, and this, this screams spam. But um, with a huge topic space like there is on Wikipedia, um, you can take your Viagra pharmacy, walk right over to the Viagra article, post it at the bottom, and this looks completely kosher to these types of algorithms, right, because it's context appropriate. And finally, we're looking at a community-driven mitigation system here. A lot of the other big players, like the Facebooks and whatnot, they have a staff who's dedicated to look for these types of things, uh, which, which were not, uh, I guess, financially afforded, or, I mean, not to say that there's not a great group of volunteers, but there's, there's something to be said for somebody forced to sit there and do it. And so, um, as, as we surveyed, there's a lot of research on vandalism, but, but link spam is kind of an interesting subset. So, um, Link spam is likely to serve the poster's off interest, and we're going to assume even that it's probably financially might um, in the case of commercial sites. So when there's money to be made, um, people will come out of the woodwork from, from everywhere. And so therefore, when we block these people, or, or we'd expect them to be very intelligent um, in the way that they conduct, conduct their behaviors on, on Wikipedia. And if you look at the sophistication at which the email spam game is played, it's extremely technical. And, and why are attackers willing to do this? Well, because there's money to be made. And so um, in an in a academic paper, I looked at Wikipedia link spam. I created a corpus, which we'll talk about how that was done. And basically, I found like, existing spam on English Wikipedia to be what we call a nuisance level. It happens, it annoys people, but uh, it's not really pervasive. And it's probably an order of magnitude smaller than the vandalism problem. And there was just less sophistication. Even, even the attackers didn't seem to be mechanized or have, or have a lot of these functionalities. And I found that it's mainly because people were subtle. They were following the rules in trying to get links to persist for a long period of time. And so this didn't really make sense to me um, because I have a lot of technical experience with Wikipedia. So I began to ask if I was to be a smart attacker, how, how would I link spam Wikipedia? And so um, I described this model and um, some statistical estimation shows that I could indeed make a, a lot of money in this way. And so we're not going to talk about the super details of this, of that, for a couple reasons. <laughs> um, but one thing you can look at here is um, there's certain traffic spikes. Um, traffic is not distributed uh, uniformly across Wikipedia articles, obviously. So if we're to look at the top table here in peak views a second during, two th during like the first three quarters of 2010, um, when the Super Bowl halftime show was being played, um, The Who, who played, and Pete Townsend, their guitarist, these articles were getting about 200 hits a second. And um, you can only imagine what would happen if you were a link spammer and smart enough to figure this out. Yes, the community might catch you quickly. And what does quickly mean here? Does it mean 30 seconds? Because if it means 30 seconds, your prized Viagra link just received 6,000 views, which is equivalent to a whole lot of email work, given how good email spam the filters are. And there's not just these cultural spikes. I mean, you're looking at certain articles here who consistently receive a huge number of hits per day. And so um, let's assume you're going to get caught. So remember that link where we had the huge font and the top and all that? Well, if you're just going to, we expect them to catch you, right? So let's just make sure everybody sees our link and we give everybody the chance to click on it. We're still going to have our 20 seconds of glory, and that could be a huge amount of traffic in that period. So, but hold on, you say. Well, these popular articles, they're smart enough to lock those down, right? Well, you know, yes, they do. They're at least locked down to auto-confirmed users. But there are trivial ways, script-driven, without a human touching a button, to get auto-confirmed accounts. And um, if you want to do this at massive scale, you're going to need a botnet or something like this, a distributed fashion, so to get around the IP blocking. But um, there's, there's well-known ways to do this. There's also other concerns. Um, there's a tool called XRumor out there, which is designed to spam wikis, um, not necessarily huge installations like English Wikipedia. But basically, it goes around the internet and finds forms and just fills them out um, with good guesses as to what should go there. 
but um, it always includes its, uh, its own link, of course, to try to attain backlinks and do search engine optimization. And there's also this much cited um, Eric Goldman paper about how there's a less of a labor force at, uh, running around Wikipedia. And that would imply even more latency in the attack I just described. If you know 10 seconds stretches to 15, you're talking about perhaps thousands more hits. So to study link spam and, and how to detect it, we need to build a corpus. Uh, you know, we need to label some edits as spam or ham. So spam edits are those that add exactly one link. The link is only the really thing, only the thing that's added really, and that they were rolled back. So we'll get into that more in a second. And ham edits are just edits that meet the same criteria, but instead of being rolled back, they were added by a privileged user. Privileged here means roll back or roll back admin or more. So the idea here is that um, I can look back into Wikipedia history, I can parse these things implicitly, and therefore for, for free, and um, I can allow these administrators who really understand the Wikipedia infrastructure to define spam for me on a case-by-case -case basis based on where they committed the uh, rollback actions. So here's, an, here's a snapshot of the vintage clothing article where someone added a um, buy your vintage dress link, which, which seems to be a quite clear instance of spam. And so we'd call this, if, if, if that link was indeed rolled back in the next edit by an administrator, we would call this spam. A, because one link was added, and two, because it's the, it's just, this is really the only thing added. So when the, when the administrator decided to press the rollback button, the only thing that could have possibly been wrong was that this link was bad. And so we, in fact, know the link was bad. If we look at this edit, for example, there's also one link added somewhere in there. This does not pass the context criteria. There could, if this was reverted, there could have been a thousand things wrong with it. And so this is not one we can include in, in the corpus. And so we did this for about um, a couple months early of this year. And we ended up with this corpus of about 6,000 edits, um, about 81% ham. We had about 1,000 instances of spam. And, and, and in that process, we also went and got the HTTP link. Whatever they were linking to, we fetched the source so we could process it later. And so now we have this data set. We have to determine the indicators or the features that are characteristic of spam or, or, or ham. And so we have a list of 55, which we'll now discuss in detail. Kidding. Um, <laughs> we'll focus on the ones that make pretty graphs, to be honest, or just really good indicators. And so they, they pull from three fields. So we can look at the Wikipedia-driven features, the metadata kind of, like we did with vandalism. We can also look at the HTML source of the page and process it. And third, we can contact third parties. And in particular, we talked to Alexa and the Google Safe Browsing Project about these things. So Wikipedia features, we can look at the URL, all types of quantities for about that, about the article, where in the article it was added, the history of the URL, how many times the URL was added this week, how many times in the past day. There's an enormous number of things that we quantify um, along these lines. But what are some of the, where are some of the best ones? And so we see that log URLs tend to be good URLs um, and, and two, for two reasons. We can imagine that the former here linking to a general domain. That's something used for, present, for promotional purposes. Whereas if you're citing a particular and very exacting document, you could imagine that there's a specific encyclopedic fact on that very specific page which someone wants, wants to see. And similarly with the domains, we see that 38% um, 30, of all spams linked directly to, to a general domain, not, not going further along the file path. Um, second, we see that spam is rarely used inside the citation environment. That's pretty intuitive. Um, advanced editors are probably only aware of this syntax, and they are exceedingly unlikely to be spammers, um, at, you know, as, the, as the numbers show. So um, much, much like with um, Vandalism, we see that spammers often refuse to leave a revision comment. So about 85% of these spam edits leave no reversion comment whatsoever, and uh, less than 20% of ham edits um, do the same. And we can also look at the three-letter domain which the URLs have. And so what we see here at the far left is the um, .com, and .info, and .net domains tend to be spammy whereas things like .edu, .gov, and .org tend to be well-behaved. And this is, this is pretty intuitive. Um, these, these, these areas have more administrative control. They also cost more. So if you need to be a truly dedicated spammer, you're going to use cheap domains for high turnover. And so one of the most interesting correlations here is um, if we look at where 
where in the article a link was added versus how old the article is. So what I've highlighted here at the top are articles that are old, more than five years. And if we highlight that half on the red half, these are articles which are added to a bottom, the bottom of a page. So basically, if you try to add to the external link section of a very old page, there's a high probability that that's vandalism. And so kind of the argument here is that external links, you know, are, that's where a lot of people use for promotional purposes. And over time, these pages evolve, but eventually they stabilize, and people decide, well, this is the appropriate set of links which should be here, it would seem, so that subsequent editions, um, they, they, they get rejected. Nothing survives down there. So as I talked about, we also fetch the um, HTML source and process it. We can look at things like how commercial it is. There's a complex algorithm to that, how profane it is. Um, and these things, these things really don't work, to be honest. And this speaks to the great diversity of spam that I I is on Wikipedia. These, these things aren't all commercial driven. They're not all shock sites. They're only marginally more profane or more commercial. Um, similarly, there's been studies done on email spam, and we re-implemented some of their things. They say that how big the landing site is, how complex the, vac the vocabulary is, um, what, what the compressibility ratio is. Um, these, these should all give indicators, and we found actually the complete opposite results that these other papers were indicating. Again, the takeaway here, speaking to, um, there's subtlety and link diversity are, are abound in the status quo of um, Wikipedia spam. <coughs> So we, we, also party, we also create two third-party sources for every link we get on Wikipedia. And so the first is the uh, Alexa web service. And so um, they give us traffic data, who is data, things like that. And we contact the Google folks for their safe browsing lists. So they maintain these URL lists that contain sites that are known to host malware and known to be engaging in phishing behavior. And so it turns out that no one's using um, Wikipedia to distribute malware. Um, at, at the current point in time. So these, 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 there were zero hits, essentially. Nothing showed up. But that doesn't mean this, this technique is worthless. So um, obviously, we're going to take this analysis, which I did offline, and we're going to build it into a live online tool. And so we, we still include these features, because it's pretty straightforward that if somebody tries to add a link that hits one of these lists, we should pop it up there with the highest priority, because something, something deviant is going on. But the Alexa data it, it is extremely useful. And so we're talking about, um, we're graphing here on the left here is the CDF of um, backlinks. And so a backlink is just saying, on the entire internet, how many incoming links are there to your page? So if I'm cis.westand, it crawls the entire link and says how many people are pointing to cis.westand. And so this type of graph processing is what Google uses in its page rank algorithm. And this is what determines how search results gets, get, 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 get ranked. So we query um, Alexa for this, and it turns out to be the best single feature. So at median, a ham link, a good link, has 850 incoming links. But when we do the same query for a spam link, we find that they have 20, just 20 backlinks on the average. So these spam sites, they're not very popular um, on, on the internet. So that's a difference of 40 times. And second, we can look at the continent um, of where these things are registered. And we find that of them all, Asia is especially poor. Um, if your site is hosted in Asia, there's a extremely high likelihood it is, in fact, spam. Um, and so there's, Alexa also provides a lot of other good features about traffic and traffic deltas and histograms and stuff like that. And they really help the end approach, but they're really not fun to look at in this type of a setting, so we'll just ignore them. So how does this, how does this work? And so we take these, these 55 features or so, and we feed them into a machine learning algorithm called an AD tree. That, or AD trees. And so um, basically what it creates is something what we're looking at here on the right here. And so you start at the root node with a value of zero. And then it goes to the first link and it says, are there more than 200 backlinks? If there's 200 backlinks, you add 0.8, your score is 0.8, and you start traversing down that tree. If it's not, you take the other path. And so you traverse these trees, and at the bottom you end up with a final value, right? And so if the final value is positive, you have a good link. And if it's the final value is negative, you have a spam link. And so some intense math is used to take these, these 55 features for every single edit and feed them in there and create a tree like this. A whole lot of statistics going on that we're not going to talk about here. So in practice, we create this tree. Um, it includes about 35 features that are actually good enough to, to warrant a distinction. We have a tree depth of about 15, so you can imagine with um, expansion, what's the word? Exponential expansion, that you're, de you're dealing with a pretty big and complex set of paths here. 
And so then we evaluate it using a technique called cross-validation, which is pretty standard in the field. You learn from 90% of the data, you test it on 10%, and then you do it all over again. And so here, here's kind of the performance. Um, let's not look at the top blue line yet, but so we, we divide the features out into where they come from. And so there's Wikipedia, which is W, which is the top line of circles in there. And there's the landing site, which is the square bars, which is the lowest gray line. And then there's the uh, third party one, that are right at the middle. And so we see basically when we look at our performance, which is the top blue line, that there's Wiki on Wikipedia features are a humongous driver of, of our performance. We'd only lose a couple percentage points of improvement if we were to completely forget the other two and just use Wikipedia. And so um, that, that's, that's somewhat discouraging for someone like me who implemented all these things. We also have to think about robustness, right? If you're dealing with a smart vandal, by its very nature, the Wikipedia features are those which are easy to fool, right? Anyone can change the length of their revision comment. Anyone can change, you know, add a link slower. They could use a registered account, so on and so forth. But what's harder to fool are the other two types. You're not going to fool Alexa because you can't, it's going to be darn expensive to go around the internet and buy 100 sites so you can all point them back to this site. It's going to be really hard to go register another domain or pay a crap ton for like a .org domain so it doesn't look, get, get looked at suspiciously. So these, these are interesting features. If we do truly see deviant people in the future, we can create a new corpus, relearn over it, and features like this can be brought into force. And so here's probably the more intuitive of the performance graphs, which is how, how well do we do um, on, on the whole. So um, on the bottom here is the false positive rate, and then the top is the recall, or the percentage of edits which you can, uh, bad edits which you can find. It's got the objective function there. And so we see that um, a 0.5% false positive rate, you can find about two-thirds of uh, all the spam which is added to um, English Wikipedia, according to this analysis. And so um, that's a realistic false positive rate in terms of bot operation, because that's what most of the bot van anti-vandalism bots are given. So that means for every 200 links, it makes about one mistake. Um, yeah, so we can imagine that um, if we take two-thirds of the spam problem on Wikipedia, that's an enormous amount of freeing of resources in terms of the humans who have been um, basically brute force searching through these links. And I mean, and, and then beyond that, as we've talked about the sticky thing, um, it's not like all hope is lost beyond that 66%, because we have a pretty good idea of their, of their ordering beyond that as well for human inspection. So we've brought so we've brought this live on Wikipedia. This is the same architecture we've been looking at all along for the sticky tool. We calculate, we get the magic scores, we put those into a priority queue. And that's, that's pretty uncontroversial. So we'll skip that for the time being. So um, much like we just, we, we, we just um, demonstrated the tool a couple minutes ago in terms of vandalism, um, it's the exact same tool um, for um, those edits. Um, the links become, they, they become hyperlinks in this case. Um, there's alerts popped up, for example. Um, if the Google safe browsing list were ever to be hit, um, it'll pop up a link saying, well, before you go manually inspect this site, you should probably know that it's hosting malware. Uh, we do a similar thing for adult content, such that reviewers, patrollers, don't go unknowingly clicking their way through to porn links. Um, but we'll, we'll defer that for the immediate time being. So, so it works. Um, it, 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 it's, it's working. Um, so there's a few adjustments. Um, so in our corpus thing, we said we could only add one link. We only look at links that add one link. But so when we do this online, we can't say the same thing, obviously, or a spammer would just add two links to get around it. So the philosophy is we score every link individually, and we take the highest score of those, and that's the score we applied to the edit. That way, no one can dilute a bad edit score. Um, so we had a crap ton of dead links on Wikipedia. Um, so I just report these to a special page right now. So I see some doubt there. And it's like, so why is somebody adding a link to Wikipedia which is dead? Um, it's often the case because of mass blanking vandalism, right? So there's an empty page, and then somebody comes back and reverts that page. That looks like 20 or 30 new links getting added to the next revision. And so we chug through all those, uh, all 30 of those links on that page. And it's unsurprising that we find tons and thousands and thousands of, of dead links, quite literally uh, several thousand a day via this method. But that's, a, that's, a, that's an entirely separate problem. Um, so I talked about this great attack model I came up with at the beginning. And um, well, these, this, this magic AD tree doesn't, isn't going to capture that attack because it's not currently in use. It's not in the corpus. The corpus doesn't show any of those, those characteristics. 
So we have a, a class where I've manually written these rule sets in such that we can do kind of signature-based detection um, along those lines. And um, the final topic here is gamesmanship. I've talked about how uh, we always assumed an attacker would try to get around these things. So how, how would an attacker defeat this system and kind of what work remains to make this more and more robust? And so the first one is content optimization, like I discussed. It's really easy to make your revision summary longer and make yourself self look like less of a spammer via that method. But aside from that, um, we have to watch out for something called TOC, T-T-O-U attacks, and this stand, stands for time of check to time of utilization. And so basically what we see, just like with vandalism on Wikipedia, is that when somebody adds a link, everybody inspects it. There's all this patrolling going on in like the first probably, you know, two to five minutes of its life. And then no one ever looks at it again. So what does a smart attacker do is um, they add a link to their site uh, and they add a redirection to the New York Times, something related, right? They, everyone clicks through, the patrollers, oh, this is great, it adds, this is a reputable source, perfect, leave this link in. Five minutes later, they go to the HTML page, change the redirection, and change it to a completely different site. And because this is happening not on Wikipedia, but on the server side of the attacker, um, this, this doesn't raise anyone's attention, but visitors will continue to leave the link. And if you look, um, this is a practical concern, there's a long-term abuse case called, um, look at, if you visit that idea, he's called Universe Daily. Um, He's been doing this, I think, for several years and claims to have thousands of links on Wikipedia right now that um, he, he's succeeded with this tactic. So this, this, is, this is a real threat. How do you address this? Um, it's, it's tough because to reprocess 37 million links every day um, is, is, is non-trivial. Similarly, there's crawler redirection. If you know where I'm coming from and where my special bot's going to investigate you, we'll just serve good content to my bot and serve bad content to all the humans who read through Wikipedia. And finally, we can imagine denial of service attacks. People just basically taking down my server by adding a trillion links at once to Wikipedia. These are ultimately attacks against the encyclopedia too, so I'd assume that someone else would, would catch them. And this is, this is the future work moving forward. And that's, that's all I have. some of what you face would already have been dealt with by the edit filter. Uh, how do you feel that deals with the corpus for link spam? Because you not only have the edit filter, but you also have the already a bot reversion system and you have a, a existing blacklist. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so there's a whole lot of bot d detection infrastructure which we haven't discussed. There's blacklist, there's, I mean, it, it, goes, it goes on and on. Um, but, but this was still a particular point of focus just because um, the, the model which I, the aggressive attack model, right, it all feeds off of seconds of human latency. And so the time it takes for things like blacklist and account blocks and warnings to accumulate, that's just, that's just more, more and more seconds. But in terms of how this has influenced the corpus, um, I mean, y y it's, it's hard to say, right? Because um, uh, there's, there's no statistics out there that I'm aware of. Of, of how the of how effective the blacklist even even is against repeat attackers. So 